Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Housen. In this Law Session, we will be considering the Constitution, or rather the idea of a Constitution, and we will, in that regard, consider both the characteristics and the sources of a Constitution. Now, before we start considering the whole idea of a Constitution, I want you to consider, first of all, what is public law about? Now, the main thrust of what we will be looking at generally is considering how the legal framework of society occurs. Now, how does it happen? What happens? How do the people who govern, what are the mandates? How, what is the protocol? So we're basically looking at governments, we're looking at the courts, we are looking at citizens. So the whole legal framework of society is what public law encapsulates. Now, generally, there's the idea that you have constitutional law as a separate head from administrative law. But when you look at public law as a topic or as a uh, program, really, it considers some aspects of constitutional law and indeed some aspects of uh, administrative law. Now, one of the most uh, comprehensive, and in fact, in my view, one of the best books that you can have on uh, constitutional and administrative law is uh, Constitutional Administrative Law by Hillier Barnett, because it sets it out in a comprehensive manner, but it is the kind of book that a law student will read. It is the kind of book that I read, because it is simple, straightforward. It looks a bit heavy, but it is not of the type of heavy books that I am not a big fan of. So for example, I've never been a fan of um, uh, Smith & Ogan, Criminal Law. I just find it a really heavy read for criminal law. But albeit that this book is somewhat big, it still comes across in simple fashion. So when you approach public law, the idea is that you will be considering constitutional law and also administrative law. Now let's start off with this. Suppose in your exam you get a question and the question says, the United Kingdom does not have a constitution. Discuss. Where would you start? Well, straight away, you should have some kind of red flags going off in your head as it relates to what types of uh, notes you should be making. The United Kingdom does not have a constitution. Discuss. Well, based on the back of that question, let's try and approach constitutional law. First of all, what is a constitution? Well, it is not as simple and as straightforward as one might think, because what is a constitution can have one of two meanings. It can have a broad meaning and it can have a narrow meaning. Now, if we start off with looking what broadly and generally is meant by a constitution, well, the broad meaning is that a constitution is a body of rules which regulate the way that the institutions within an organization operates, so it looks at it internally, as well as the way in which it relates to external entities. Now, that is it in the context of an organization. Now, if we consider broadly what it is in relation to a state, a constitution will organize, distribute, and regulate state power. So a broad definition of a constitution as it relates to a state is that it sets out the structure of the state. It sets out the major state institutions. It sets out the principles which govern the state's relations with each of the state uh, agencies and institutions, as well as the relationship between the state and its citizens. What is the purpose that it is there for? Well, the purpose of a constitution, whether it is of a state or indeed of an organization, it tends to establish the traditional organs of the state. Now, in the context of again, remaining on the broad definition, in the context of a state, 
you look at the establishment of the traditional organs of the state, which is, of course, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Now, what it does, it allows some detail to be set out in respect of the allocation of the powers between these three branches of the state, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Now, it provides for the resolution of disputes, again, on the interpretation of the Constitution uh, insofar as how these particular organs will work either with each other or indeed with the citizen. And the idea is that it allows for the, for the possibility of making amendments where appropriate while, of course, outlining procedures for change. So whatever the Constitution is, it is some way there for the ability to change and certainly expand if possible or indeed contract if that's the case. Now to explain the relationship between, between the state and its citizenry is also what a constitution will do broadly. So that is the broad basis. A constitution, when we look at it, is what regulates the framework. But what if we look at it as a narrow meaning, which even though I was talking about that in a broad sense, I'm sure some of you went to the narrow meaning immediately. Now, the narrow meaning is that a constitution will typically be contained in a single document, usually called constitution, which provides a basic framework for a state system of govern governance. And what it does is that it defines the relationship between the state and its citizens and between the institutions of the states themselves. Now, the vast majority of times, this narrow meaning will, of course, uh, rest on the premise that the Constitution, where it's in a single document, is generally the highest source of law in a particular state. Now, it wasn't until the 18th century when the U.S. and the French written constitutions were developed that the concept of the Constitution came to have this kind of alternative and more narrow meaning. Now, when you see countries which have this narrow meaning, meaning an, a, a codified constitution in a single document, it tends to be countries that have gone through some type of radical political change and therefore it results in a written constitution or some sort of identifiable document which establishes the traditional organs of the state such as the executive, the legislature and the judiciary and detail the allocation of power between those branches as well as providing for the resolution of disputes on the interpretation of the Constitution. It will also generally provide for the possibility of amending and it will also provide as well the outline for change and explain the relationship between the state and its citizen citizenry. Now that is going back to what the broad meaning is. But what we have is a document which takes on board the broad meaning. So it sets it out in a codified format. Now, what I want you to take on board, of course, is that don't believe that just because you have a single document, that is a constitution for all intents and purposes. Because precisely what that codified document provides for, when you look in a, for example, a, a state which does not have a single codified document, the same framework will be there, but not necessarily in a single codified document. Now, as I say, the general rule, of course, when you look at these narrow constitutions is that they've undergone some type of radical change. Now, the examples of radical events that have in fact influenced the drafting uh, of governing rules in a lasting permanent form have been, for example, wars. 
So whether they are interstate or civil wars. So, for example, when we look at uh, the USA and bearing in mind its own history and when we look at its uh, constitution, we see that this came about after some radical change. Equally, there may be a situation where a revolution has been fought and as such, what you get is a fundamental change in the power structures. Now, the granting of independence or where there is unification leading to the creation of a new state or a renewed state may also give rise to a brand new constitution. So what you tend to find by and large is that when you look at the vast majority of Commonwealth countries who, for example, had um, the UK or had England or uh, any other European country like France or the Netherlands as their mother country, as it were, you tend to find that after there's been a period of independence, you tend to find that you get these nations and these states having a constitution. So when you look at countries like uh, Nigeria or South Africa or Jamaica, you see that these countries will tend to have a constitution in the narrow definition sense which has come about by radical change that radical change being independence now it is interesting and will be interesting to see what the effect of scotland seeking to for example have a referendum to break away from the uk and certainly it must be that as a new state it will possibly have a codified constitution but that awaits to be seen. But what you, we do know is generally, after you go through radical change, you get this codified constitution. Now, the codification of citizens' rights and powers of the political system is viewed generally as an essential step towards good governance. You want it codified so that at least the citizen will know where they stand as it relates to state power. What you don't want is a state being able to barge in your house for any given reason or in fact no reason at all. So generally you have a constitution which will set out in it exactly what the state's rights, sorry, the limitation on the right a state has in order to, for example, um, affect a citizen's rights. Now, when you consider the uh, narrow meaning of a constitution and indeed if we were to for example consider certain states and their constitution we can see exactly what the constitution says it does so what i want us to do for a moment is to to reflect on actual constitutions of certain countries and see what exactly the constitution says it is and how exactly that constitution works. Now, I will take a short break and as we come back, we will begin immediately by looking at how within a narrow meaning constitution, meaning a codified document, how the document itself lays out what exactly it does. We will pick up after a short break. 